at this juncture of our immersion in Rambam's 13 Principles of Faith, I believe it is the appropriate time to dwell on a very complicated, difficult, vexing problem. And this problem is known by a few different names, and it is presented in a few different, uh, with a few different angles. And the problem is most, I would say most often described as why bad things happen to good people. Now, as we'll see, the problem is not just why bad things happen to good people. The problem is also why good things happen to bad people. But more broadly speaking, in the second principle of the 13 principles, Rambam tells us that everything, good things, bad things, all of them are expressions of God's singularity. There's only one domain. There isn't the good, the bad. There isn't, you know, the, the force that is giving us good and we hope to get more of that. And the force that comes bad, we hope to avoid that. There's only one source of power and that's the Almighty. Ergo, when something bad happens, well, that's because of God. And this gives rise to what's known in philosophical terms as theodicy, trying to reconcile the definition that we had of God, of God and the definition that we talked about in this series, namely that God is good, God created the world to give us goodness, and it's just good. If it's just good, well, how come there is the existence of bad? If God is good and wants to do good, how come he does what seems to us to be to be bad. Now, one of the things that you're told in rabbi school is that there's some things that you don't talk about. You don't talk about homosexuality. It's too divisive a subject, too sensitive. You don't know what the audience is. And you don't talk about the Holocaust. Those are two things that are things that are way too dicey. Just avoid these thorny subjects. There's maybe others on that list. But I think there's no greater example of this problem than the the Holocaust. The Torah tells us we're God's chosen people. We're the kingdom of priests. We're the holy nation. We'll survive forever. All these good things. Yet, a lot of bad things happen to us. And of course, the Holocaust is the most modern expression, maybe the most egregious expression of the suffering that our nation has, have to, has, has had to experience over our history. But all of Jewish history is a litany of pogroms, expulsions, blood libels, inquisition. It has, it's been kind of a rough ride. Now, it's important to note, this is, should not come to any surprise. You read the Torah, there are uh, sections in the Torah, namely at the uh, end of Leviticus, towards the end of Deuteronomy, there's dedicated portions. And of course, it's the implied message of the Torah is that you do mitzvahs, you abide by the Torah, fantastic things will happen to you, both here and in Olam both on our physical plane and on our spiritual plane, but implied and frequently actually explicit in the Torah is the fact that if we disobey God, if we disobey the Torah, if we move away from what the Almighty wants of us, then we're going to be shoved back to the path frequently in very painful ways. So the the fact that bad things happen both to individuals and on a national scale is something that exists and I think it's something that's it's worthwhile to discuss this, the topic in a very fundamental way. And I, I want to give some framework how I see the question. Maybe there's different ways to present it, but I think this is a, it's an easy way to, to frame this problem. There's three assumptions that I think constitute the backbone of this question. The first one is what we call the second principle of, of the Rambam's 13. Namely, that God maintains total control over everything that happens. Every occurrence is supervised by him. And we also believe that what occurs to humans is supervised on an individual level. 
And there's a discussion, for example, the almighty supervision of animals. Is that on an individual level? Some say maybe yes. Others say no, it's only on a species-wide level. But regardless, for sure for humans, it seems to be unanimous from all the sources. Nothing transpires against humans against God's will. So God oversees everything. A. Assumption A. Assumption B, that the definition that we have of, of God is that he's good, that he's just, that he's benevolent, that he's fair. That's what we believe. Yes, yeah, that's assumption number two. Assumption number three is that unfair things, ungood things, if you will, bad things happen, injustices happen, indiscriminate things happen. And how does that fit in? If the Almighty is good, the Almighty oversees everything, everything that happens to us, or certainly things that are outside of free will, which is, again, that was more to the discussion last time, how does free will, what role does free will play in determining what happens to humanity? Oh. But certainly there's room for this question that these three assumptions can all be true. If God is good and God is in total control, then everything that happens should be good. If bad things happen, then either God is not in total control, there's other forces that are in control, or God is in total control but is not good or is not fair or is not just or is not benevolent. So that creates the the problem. Something has to give. These three assumptions cannot all be true. A student of mine once told me that she was privy to a conversation that happened between certain people. And one of the person quipped that uh, how did the Almighty allow the Holocaust to happen? He had no choice. It was against his will. That's what this person quipped. He was helpless to stop it. To that person, we say that you are one of the people that Ralam tells us because you don't believe in the 30 principles of faith, you have excluded yourself from the Jewish people. You're rejecting the second principle of the 13. God does control all. Nothing can happen against his will. Now, the fact that his will can be inclusive is something we spoke about last time. But to say that he was helpless to stop it, it happened against his will, that is something that's against our faith. But for us, it raises questions. How can God be number one? In total control, number two, all good, yet we witness bad things or things that we could we have no way to explain them other than this is not good, this is bad, this is an injustice. That's the general framework for the question. Now, before we kind of dive in to the subject and try to really understand it on a uh, on a fundamental level, going through some of the sources and really probing this important subject, I think there's several introductions that are necessary. And if we don't have these introductions, everything else that will follow will probably will probably be futile and fruitless. So these are not just introductions for the sake of having introductions. My grandfather, a blessed memory, says it's important to give intro- introductions because content has to be presented in a way that will be – people will recognize that it's important. So you give an introduction. So sometimes you give introduction, even introduction is not needed. This is my introduction to the introduction to tell you that this introduction is – these are all needed. Without these, you really cannot probe the subject. So the first introduction is – that we have to understand that this question or this general topic exists on multiple levels, on multiple dimensions. There's an emotional question and then there's an intellectual and or philosophical question. We have a mitzvah of the Torah, according to most, uh, according to the Ramah, for example, he understands that there's a mitzvah of the Torah for us to mourn when our relatives die. Relative dies, you mourn. Wait a minute. Don't we know that everything God does is for the best? Don't we know that the Almighty is in total control? Everything is all planned and this is all good? Maybe. That's a philosophical point. Humans are not just robots. We're not computers and we are a bundle of confusion sometimes, but certainly included in that cocktail is emotions. And the emotions are very deep and very fundamental and are not to be ignored, 
even by Torah. Even by Torah, which guides us at a very high level, it does not ignore that. There's a mitzvah to mourn. And in fact, there is a story that the Torah tells us quite quickly, but it really should banish the notion that this is not something that can be viewed emotionally. We read in Genesis chapter 23, verse 1, the life of Sarah was 127 years. Those were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah, Sarah died in Kiris Arba, in Hebron, Lana Canaan, and Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and to mourn her. So the first thing we notice here is that it gives us a little description of Sarah's passing, where it was, but then it tells us that Abraham came to eulogize Sarah and to mourn her. The story goes on to tell us that Abraham had to negotiate with Ephron to buy the, the plot of land, the, the cave, that is the cave of the patriarchs until today in the city of Hebron. But what we find out from this verse is, number one, the age of Sarah. If you were to say that someone died at the age of 100, Everyone say, well, they lived a good life. They, they, they had their time here. If someone lived to 120 and 127, okay, they, they did their share. <laughs> you know, it's, the time has come that no one would view that as a tragedy. Number one. Number two, if you could construct, if you could go to a lab and construct a person that is most equipped to deal with a, an issue on a philosophical, intellectual, theoretical level, would probably look like Abraham. Abraham was the one who was willing to do everything for God, to abandon his family, to be thrown into the fire, to even kill his son Isaac, which is the event that immediately preceded that. He was someone who was able to divorce his philosophical understanding from his emotion. If anyone could do it, it would be Abraham. What does he do? She dies, he eulogizes her, and he mourns her, and he weeps over her. I think the Torah is telling us this story to tell us that if there was ever a case in history where a death of a relative, of a loved one, could be not as emotionally challenging, it would be this. Sarah's really old. She lived a very robust life. Abraham is the most equipped to deal with on a philosophical level. Nevertheless, Abraham mourns and Abraham eulogizes her. What this is telling us is that the appropriate way to cope when tragedy is present is not the way we're about to do it. So if someone says, oh, I have a, it really hurts me, it really pains me, let me deal with that question, this is not a discussion for you. Because even Abraham, he dealt with it on a raw emotional level, crying and mourning. So that's telling us, number one, that that's a legitimate response to tragedy, to pain. We don't reject the emotional aspects of life and suffering. But also that if we try to take these two domains and we conflate them, we're not going to get very far. So for the purposes of our discussions of, of what's known as theodicy, it's very important to not focus on the emotional or at least to focus solely on the philosophical components of this discussion. Maybe that's why in rabbi school they tell you don't talk about the Holocaust. It's a very sensitive issue. So I always say that there was the first Holocaust of Hadrian in the 130s. It's probably, you know, easier for us to divorce our sensitivities, our emotions from that Holocaust. And, and therefore it's a less emotionally charged one. And it's probably easier for us to orient a philosophical discussion on themes either of people that we don't know or of, of, of theoretical Questions, And I think it's also important, you know, it's not only a sensitive uh, topic, it's also a relevant topic. And it's a dangerous topic. It's relevant because almost everyone, I would say probably everyone, has some history of tragedy, of suffering. Certainly, collectively as a nation, we've experienced our fair share of tragedy and suffering. But every individual, every, every human either has personally experienced suffering or tragedy, or has experienced it in their in their very close circles. So that's why I'm acknowledging ahead of time. We're all acknowledging ahead of time that 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 this this could go off the rails because if we don't realize that the vector in which we're discussing is the philosophical one, we're not going to get very far. 
And also, I want to point out that the issue is not just a theoretical issue. It's a very real issue. and It's a very raw issue for people. And that's why I said it's dangerous because it could create crises of faith. When people say, how come that God didn't help me? Where was he? Where was he when we were all suffering? Where was he when I was suffering? It's a very legitimate question, I would say. And it could very quickly go from being something which is very nice and theoretical in the abstract to being very practical for a lot of people. So I want to just lay that out in front. It's a very important introduction to understand that we're not discounting the emotional components of this of this dilemma. Instead, we're going to try to focus on another legitimate question, which is the philosophical, the philosophical components of it. That's point number one. Point number two, which maybe is an extension of point number one, the introduction is needed is that a scale of suffering does not matter from the philosophical point of view. It doesn't matter how large the perceived injustice is. It doesn't matter. For the sake of this discussion, we don't assume that God has any lack of bandwidth. So the fact that there's billions of people, the Imam can have oversight equally on all of them. Maybe the righteous have more oversight, but it's not because of lack of resources for God. There's no lack of resources. In our world, there's scarcity. Maybe we haven't reached peak oil, but oil is still expensive because there's, it's still scarce. We live in a world of scarcity. We, it's hard for us to conceptualize the concept that, that God does not, there's no, there's no lack of resources. There's no, there's no concept of scarcity for him. And, Therefore, the suffering, the pain, the question that we're talking about, it doesn't matter if it's something which is devastating. People are dying. There's a tsunami and people are dying. Why does, why does God do that? That's a question. But that same question, at least from the philosophical point of view, is why, why did I stub my toe, my toe? Emotionally, of course, it doesn't get the same, doesn't get the same tension, right? But from a philosophical perspective, it, it doesn't, the scale doesn't really matter. Suffering is suffering. And I think the Talmud points this out. The Talmud, the book of, of Arachan, and this is the Talmud we'll use for both this introduction, but also later it's going to help give us a little bit of context, a little bit of perspective. The Talmud asks the following question. How minute of suffering does suffering need to be for it to register? Says the Talmud, one of the rabbis said, if you go to the tailor, and the tailor sews for you a garment, and the garment doesn't fit, that's enough suffering for it to register. That, that's already suffering. Of course, no, no one's dead, and of course, you'll get your money back. Still, it's a hassle. I'll say today, you know, you order something from Amazon. When we order from Amazon, you order you gotta order 12, because you never know which one's going to fit. My son, uh, he wanted to get new shoes. We got him new shoes. Size 5, perfect. They come, and they're this size, because they're size 5. They're like four inches. Size, what? Size, size no, they're, they're size five for babies. Oh, no. He was so excited every day. Did my, did my shoes come? Did my shoes come? My shoes come? They're, they're literally for a newborn. So we, we, bought them, we bought them bigger, nicer ones. We returned those. But that, that's suffering. Of course, it's funny, but that's considered suffering by the Almighty. That's according to the first penny of the Talmud. The second penny is like, no, 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 no. There's even less suffering that registers. If someone wants to have a hot drink and he gets a cold drink, that's that's a, that already registered. You know, like it's like if you have to drink lukewarm water, it's kind of you, – you want the water to be cold, right? You want it to be cold and if you get lukewarm water, that's suffering. If your clothing that you bought, not a new one, but your clothing that you bought and it's, it's already starting to wear out, it's, you put it on backwards, you know, sometimes you like, you see the kids, the undershirts on backwards, or, or you have to take it off, you gotta put it back on, uh, it's a little bit of a hassle, uh, I, a few weeks ago, I was, uh, halfway to shul on Friday night and I looked down at my feet and the right shoe is a nice Shabbos shoe and the left shoe is a nice Shabbos shoe. Beautiful dress shoes. It just they're not they're not a match. <laughs> they're not a match. The right shoe, and I had to turn around, go home. Okay, I was thinking yeah, maybe well, no one probably would have noticed anyhow, but they were close enough, similar enough for me to get them confused. But uh, I actually went back and 
that that's that's suffering according to the uh, this this uh, Talmud. And finally, the Talmud says, if you stick it in your pocket and you're trying to get change, and you need three coins, and you end up with two, and you got to stick your hand in your pocket again to get a third coin, that's suffering. Thomas says, well, what if you what if you need two, but you pull out three? Is that considered suffering? Thomas says, no, well, if you need two, if you need two, you pull out three, it's no big deal. You have two ready, and just put your hand back in your pocket. That, that, that wouldn't consider, but if you need three, you get two, and you have to go through the incredible hassle of sticking it in your pocket again, that's already considered suffering. So, Every time there's a discussion in the Talmud of this nature, you have to say, okay, does it really matter? Like what? The Talmud is not just discussing suffering for no purpose. There, there must be some sort of purpose. What, what difference does it make? What is the least amount of suffering for it to register? So that's the Talmud. Like why is it so important to bring all these rabbis? Rabbis deal with important things. Why are they discussing something as insignificant apparently as how much is the minimum amount of suffering needed for suffering to be registered? So the Talmud explains, quoting a teaching from the Academy of Rabbi Yishmael, because if someone has 40 days without any suffering, you know this person has exhausted their reward in Olam Their spiritual world in the afterlife, they've used it up by having 40 suffering free days. And therefore, it's very important to get a little bit of suffering, fumble a little bit of change, order stuff from Amazon that don't fit. It's very important to have nuisances in your life because if you don't have any nuisances, you lost your alma That's the first answer. Secondly, quotes from Ma'arava, which means in the West, the sages of Israel said, why is it important to know how it's the minimum amount of suffering? Because if you don't have suffering for 40 days, then you should know that punishment is on your doorstep. Punishment is beckoning. You should be careful because you're going to be punished really soon. And therefore, you want to make sure you have a little bit of loose change that uh, that you're fumbling for. So I think uh, this last part of the Talmud gives us maybe a little bit of a hint of why we have suffering. But I think for our introduction's sake, for the purposes of the philosophical discussion, it's important to stress that the scale does not really matter. Even the most minute amount of suffering would register for the context of the philosophical dilemma of suffering. If someone stubs their toe, if someone has an ingrown toenail, uh, if someone has any one of the nuisances in life, I would say probably, you know, if you go on a checkout lane, it's uh, it's very difficult for me to go shopping in a real store because I'm always thinking, well, which one of these lanes is most likely? You see, this one has, you know, there's two people there, but they have very little, few amount of stuff. And then there's one person there, they have a lot of stuff. Which one of them is going to go faster? Uh, my wife, she avoids all these problems. She just takes the lane and she's just happier. And then invariably what happens to me, I choose the lane that is the most optimized. And what do they do? They pull out the checkbook. They pull out the checkbook and then you got to write the check and they got to check what's going on. You got to show ID and it's three minutes already and I'm suffering. <laughs> uh, coupons, yeah. And the coupons come, yes. Uh, and then like, well, actually, I believe it said it was 397 over there, not uh, for, you know, 425. So it, it always happens to me. So, um, so, uh, so it's an important, uh, important point here that, uh, our life is full of nuisances. And that is the discussion, not just, God forbid, someone breaks a limb, God forbid, something really bad happens, then they lose their job, uh, they don't get accepted into the university they want to go to, uh, uh, they, a relationship that they thought would go someplace dissolves. The big things in life that make us ask those questions, that's kind of more on the emotional side, and here it seems to orient on a much smaller side. That's the second introduction. The third introduction is something we've we've hinted at, but something that's necessary to talk about explicitly, and that is that it's a very difficult subject. And for example, I think it's important to talk about the story of the death of Rabbi Akiva, because often that is presented as the canonical, archetypal example of suffering of the righteous. Who was more righteous than Rabbi Akiva? Nobody. Who suffered worse than Rabbi Akiva? Nobody. 
that really creates a sharpened question for us. Someone who was unambiguously the most righteous or one of the most righteous sages of his era and unambiguously suffered incredibly by the hands of the Romans. And that, of course, really presents the question in, in a way that's really unavoidable. So the story the Talmud tells us in the book of Brachos on page 61b, it's talking about the first Holocaust that like we mentioned. It's uh, Roman, the Romans, uh, Hadrian, they make a rule outlawing Torah study. You study Torah, you study Torah publicly, you're going to be executed. And what does Rabbi Tiva do? Rabbi Tiva is gathering the students and teaching them Torah. So someone comes over to him and says, you're crazy, they're going to kill you. Don't do it. Aren't you worried about the ruthless kingdom of the Romans? So Rabbi Tiva responds to him with a parable. He gives him a parable of the fox and the fish. The fox walks to the waterfront and sees a fish. And the fish is dodging, is is darting at the edge of the water. So the fox tells the fish, why are you being so evasive? Why are you da- darting? Why are you dodging at the ed- edge of the water? It says, well, there's these fishermen and the fishermen want to catch me. And they spread out nets all over the water. So I'm trying to avoid the nets by going at the edge of the water. I'm trying to avoid the nets by taking these evasive maneuvers. So the fox says, well, I have a solution. You look as far as you could see on land. There's no nets. Come on land and you'll be safe. That's what the fox proposes to the fish. So the fish responds, you're supposed to be the most clever of animals. You're not a clever one. You're a fool. Don't you realize if I come out of the water, I'm dead anyhow. If in the place that I have life, there's a danger, how much more dangerous would it be in the place where I don't have life? He says Rabbi Kiva to this individual who told him to try to stop teaching. He says, well, Torah is our life. Only while we are immersed in Torah, only then can we have life. There's dangers. We have to try to avoid the dangers. But the solution is not to leave the water. The solution is to dodge, try to dodge the bullets and not to leave the Torah, to not abandon the Torah, which gives us life. Eventually, Rabbi Tiva was arrested and he was incarcerated. And you know who else was incarcerated? That other dude. He was incarcerated for some other reason. And eventually, sitting next to each other in the cell, And the guy tells him, you're praiseworthy. Both of us ended up in prison, but at least you did it for a good cause. Praiseworthy are you that you were caught for for teaching Torah. The narrative continues. Rabbi Kiva was executed by the Romans in a very macabre, very brutal, barbaric fashion. They flayed him and... The Talmud goes on to describe that as he was being killed in this horrific manner, he was saying the Shema. And the student said to him, why are you saying the Shema now? And he responded, well, my whole life, every time I said the Shema, and we say we should love God with all your hearts, with all your with all your resources, with, with all your soul. What does that mean? It means even if God takes away your soul, you should love God. Even if God kills you, so to speak. And every day that I said that, I was hoping to have an opportunity to die for God. And now I finally have the opportunity to die for God. I cannot wait to say the Shema in this variety, now as I'm being killed. And as he got to the last verse of the Shema, the last word of the Shema, Echad, his soul departed, and a prophetic voice boomed, praiseworthy a Yorubi Tiva, because your soul departed with one, with the word one, with the word Echad. And then the postscript of this of this narrative is what I want to talk about. Even though I want everyone to keep track of the Talmud because the Talmud itself is going to come up again. The postscript goes that the angels started protesting to God. And they said to him, Zu Torah, Vizu Schara. This is the Torah and this is the reward. Rabbi Kiva, he's the embodiment. He's the paragon. He's the personification of Torah. And this is his reward. This is what you allowed to happen to him. Essentially, they're asking our question. 
That's such a terrible thing. I'm a Torah Kiva. And the Almighty doesn't seem to respond to them. There's, there's no, there's no, di- there's no back and forth. There's no dialogue. And a second voice, prophetic voice boomed. Praiseworthy is Rabbi Kiva. You are welcome to Olamaba. So I think it's noteworthy that the angels, you think if anyone knew the answer to why Rabbi Kiva died, it would be the angels. They're from the different realm. They don't have the emotional hangups that we have. They're totally intellect. They understand the spiritual workings. They should, they should get it. And they ask the question, why does he die? I would think if anyone could understand this subject thoroughly, it would be the angels and the angels themselves in the canonical example of, of theodicy, they themselves don't seem to know the answer. And they asked, Zu Torah, Zu it's, it's incongruous. You have Torah mastery, such a high level. And you have such a horrific death, it doesn't seem to jive. That's an important point to note that the angels themselves could not seem to really understand the answer to this question that we're talking about today. Now, what's very noteworthy is that those same identical words, Zu Torah, Zu Schar, this is Torah, this is its reward, appear elsewhere in the Talmud, to my knowledge, one other place. The first narrative was from the book of Brachos, page 61b. The second one from the book of Menachos, page 29b. And it's telling of Moses. Moses, at the time that he ascended to heaven to get the Torah, he saw the Almighty doing something very unusual. He was making little crownlets above the letters. If you look at a Torah scroll, you'll see that there's certain letters that have little crowns on top of it. And Moses says, I don't get it. You're writing us a Torah. You have to embellish it with, with crownlets. Why, why are you doing that? So the Almighty says to him, okay, I'll give you the answer. In many generations, hence, there's going to be a great sage by the name of Akiva ben Yosef, Akiva son of Joseph. And he's going to study the Torah so deeply, not only to study the laws of the Torah, not only to study the words and the letters of the Torah, but he's also going to study the little jot and tittles above the letters. He's going to study the crownlets above the letters. And therefore, I'm doing it for him. Moses is so bamboozled by this. Show me him. I want to see him. So the Amai says, okay, turn around. He goes into the time machine and he's parachuted into Rabbi Kiva's study hall 1,500 years later. This is the first recorded instance of actual time travel. Moses is sitting at the back of eight rows of Rabbi Kiva's students, and he does not understand what is happening. They're talking Torah, and it's above him. And he gets very dejected, very sad. How is it possible? I'm here to get the Torah, and I don't even know it myself. How am I going to be the conduit to give the Jewish people the Torah? Until finally, the students ask Rabbi Kiva, well, where is this law from? You're quoting a law. What's the source? Is halacha l'mosh Messina? This is a law that comes from Moses at Sinai. Moses hears that, and he's mollified. He's assuaged. He's okay, okay. I, I, it seems like I did make it. And he goes back to God and says, God, I, I don't get it. I was by Rabbi Kiva's lecture. He's way greater than me. Give the Torah... Not via me. He's the right man for the job, not me. Why are you asking me to give the Torah to the Jewish people? And the Almighty responds to him, don't ask such questions. Keep quiet. Silence. This is the way I work. You don't get it. You don't understand it. So Moses says, okay, I have one more request. You showed me Rabbi Akiva's Torah prowess. Now I want to see his reward. Show me his reward. So once again, the Almighty plates is Moses into the time machine. And he is sent not to Rabbi Kiva's lecture hall, but to the very same scene described in the book of Brachos, Rabbi Kiva's death. And he sees this, and he sees what they're doing with Rabbi Kiva's body. And he rushes back to God, and he says the same words that the angels said, Zu Torah, v'zu schar, this is Torah, this is its reward. It's incongruent. How is it possible that he was being treated like this? And again, the Almighty responds cryptically, Stoke, keep quiet, silence. 
this is the way I work, you'll never understand it. So, of course, you read this Talmud, there's all kinds of questions that are immediately raised. Moses is able to time travel somehow 1,500 years into the future. That's almost like the smallest question of this. It's the only time the Talmud, to my knowledge, talks about that. And of course, this is the time that Moses is in heaven, so he's obviously being removed from one dimension, being brought to a different dimension, where time is not linear, where time is not rigid, where time is not fixed, which is an amazing idea. But then we see that Rabbi, Rabbi Tiva's lecture is attended to by Moses, and Moses doesn't understand it. Another question that all the commentators say, how is it possible Moses doesn't understand it? How is that even possible? And then Moses comes back and tells God, well, give the Torah via him. God says, no, show me his reward, Moshe requests. And it seems like the Almighty shows him something very different. It's not his reward that the Almighty shows Moses. It's Rabbi Tiva's suffering, his pain. I don't get it. Moshe asked to see the reward and God showed him something else. Moses seems to ask a very legitimate question. Zu Torah, Vazu Schar, this is the Torah and this is its reward? And then I said, silence, you don't get it. It doesn't seem like it's a legitimate answer to a, what seems to be, for us, a very legitimate question. These are good questions to hold. Maybe we'll talk about it in the future because I think that there are some keys here to really broaden the subject of understanding this. But I think for our purposes, again, we're still in the middle of the introductions to the subject. For our purposes we see that not only the angels don't understand why the Almighty treats Rabbi Tiva like that, even Moses, at the time Moses is in heaven, he too doesn't understand it. He too has a question. He doesn't seem to get a really good answer. If the angels don't understand it, or don't understand it fully, and Moses doesn't understand it, doesn't understand it fully, we have to realize, we have to acknowledge, we have to have the humility to acknowledge that it's probably something that's beyond us as well. But there's a third source in the Talmud. And I think this would really banish any any hubris that we may have on the subject. The Talmud is talking about Adam, but not just Adam after he made a big blunder. Adam before he made the big blunder. Which the Talmud describes, this is this, this is uh an amalgam of all of humanity mixed into one, all fused into one. All of us are different parts of Adam. All of Adam, and all of humanity, all of the humanity's intellect, everything is coalesced in one man. And the descriptions that we get of him are, are superlative. He sees from one of the world to the other. He's, he's so vast. His stature is, is, is incredible. And the Talmud tells us in the book of Sanhedrin, page 38b, that the Almighty showed the book of humanity to Adam, which means he showed him every generation, all the movers and shakers of each generation. This generation, its teachers. This generation, its scholars. All the people of each generation. And he showed him Rabbi Akiva. And it gives us a little, a little line, just one liner here. Samach betoraso vinis atsev bimisaso. Adam was delighted with Robert Hiva's Torah and saddened with Robert Hiva's death. So even though it's not the same identical words, it's the same experience that Moses had and that the angels had when they witnessed Robert Hiva is this contrast. The Torah is amazing. His role in Jewish history and consequently human history is so vital and his death does not seem to be fitting for the person that he, that he, that he was. If the angels and Moses and Adam before his sin, if they don't understand it, we have to acknowledge that there's going to be limitations in how much we can understand it. And in fact, the Ramban Nachmanides in a section of a book called Shar Hagmul, it's published as its own book which is literally means the gates of reward, which is his, his treatise on reward and punishment and matters of eschatology, he says that we cannot really understand this difficult subject. Now, if we can't understand it, should we just go home? 
I, I think that we could still acknowledge that the subject cannot be fully understood and still try to ponder it, try to understand it as best as we can. Even though we acknowledge that we can't understand it fully, we could say, okay, well, why can't we understand it fully? And try to understand it partially. Or at least try to understand what it is that we don't understand. Give context to what it is and then ultimately acknowledge that fully we can never really – it won't really resonate with us. But at least we can get, have some sort of context in this in this subject. So those are my three introductions I think are are, 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 are very vital. Number one, the, the question of the, the emotional versus the philosophical dilemmas. Number two, the fact that scale doesn't matter. Number three, that we have to also acknowledge before we get into the subject that – it is truthfully, to understand it truthfully, completely, it's beyond us. If it's beyond Moses, beyond Adam, it's beyond the angels, it's certainly beyond us. Those are my general introductions. Uh, a fourth point, which is, I will call it like an introduction, but more like a general perspective, which is uh, a way of easing into the, our answers of, or at least our perspectives that we gain from, from the sages, from the sources on the subject, is more of like a, a, a general attitude. And this is probably something which is valuable throughout our lives and certainly valuable as we're trying to understand the Rambam's 13 principles of faith and especially trying to understand God. The gulf between us and God cannot be more fr- – that sh- there's nothing that could possibly equal that distance. You know, we look at an ant on the floor scurrying around. This is the time of year where people have ants in their kitchen. Uh, you gotta call the, this is the time of the year where all the exterminators are very busy. But you see an ant and it's, it's nothing. It's a tiny ant that's running around scurrying around. You can crush it in an instant. And it's just there trying to get some food. It's like, it's so diminutive compared to you. It's, it's like nothing. It's, you don't value it at all. It's like, it's, it's something which is it versus you. It's intellect versus your intellect. It's world. It's purview. Compared to yours, the difference is, is incredible. Compared to God, we're much less than an, than an ant. The, the difference between us and God is a billion times the difference between us and an ant. It, there's really no, there's no overlap. So it's like silly for us that like the ant is trying to ask questions. Well, why are these humans acting so silly? You know, why are they being so silly? Why are they being so weird? Why are they being so bizarre? That's what the ant is saying. And the ant is so stupid, has such little knowledge. Intellect is so, it's so infinitesimally small. It's so minute. It's silly for it really to ask this question. So that's a general, a general perspective that we see. It's like, we're trying to understand the ways of God. It, it's so beyond us. How can we try to understand it? And I, I heard once a parable, you know, before 9-11. You walk in, I remember uh, when I was a little kid, we flew to Israel as a family. I remember trying to, trying to get those pins they gave out in TWA. Most people don't even remember TWA. Trans World Airlines, right? TWA, Tower Air. These are the airlines that uh, used to exist and fly to Israel. So you try to get like a button. Try You go speak to the, the stewardess or the, the um, now they're called flight attendants. Uh, you go, you maybe get a tour of the cockpit. My father is a, is a licensed pilot, so you would always try to get in with the, with the, to look at it. You walk into like a 747 into the cockpit and there's, you know, a thousand knobs, a thousand buttons, all kinds of switches, all kinds of paraphernalia that could be tweaked by the pilots. A small child walks in and he asks the, he asked the, the pilot, this orange knob, what does this do? It's a good question, but it's really a silly question. Like, you don't ask a question about one knob out of a thousand knobs, one switch out of a thousand switch. Imagine if there was 10,000 switches. It's silly to, to ask about one small sliver of the whole picture. When we ask a question of why does God do things, it's, it's, it's like that kid. You know, we don't, we don't know anything. Our, our field of vision is the narrowest of narrow slivers. And even in the context of a thousand years, even in the context of a lifetime, even in the context of the world that we're in today, you know, there's seven billion humans. 
what experience of humanity does each one of us have on our own? A point zero 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 one percent, right? That's what it is. Yeah, we think we know everything. And that's not just today, here and now, where we do know a lot. We have the internet, we we have media, we can understand a little bit, we can read books. All of humanity, all of history, all of our souls, we 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 our our perspective is really narrow. And therefore, maybe this is an understanding as to why we don't understand because we don't we don't know. The child wants to know what this switch does. This switch is part of a whole bigger picture. Everything works in unison. It's a very hard for us to wrap our heads on uh, around that because this this I want to know this knob, uh, this knob uh, in isolation. But in the big picture, the Almighty is the pilot, so to speak. He is the one who really understands everything, and everything fits in together. The uh, episode of those planes crashing, uh, withstanding, um, generally speaking, uh, the Almighty has knows what he's doing. Uh, not, the example doesn't perfectly fit, but generally speaking, the pilots know what they're doing. The Almighty definitely knows what he's doing, and everything works together if you see the entire picture, which only, of course, God does. The Chazon Ish, who was the leader of the religious Jews in Israel at the beginning of the founding of the state, he once had a Holocaust survivor that obviously suffered tremendously during those years of hell. And he's like, what was God thinking? He told the great rabbi, what was God thinking? And he was obviously someone who was very pained by that experience, but was expressing it in in a very harsh manner. So the great rabbi pulls out a volume of Talmud it says, okay, well, read me this, this, this commentary on the site. Explain it to me. So he tries to explain it, and the rabbi asks him a question. No, you obviously, you don't, you don't understand it. I ask your question. So the, guy, the guy says, okay, I'm going to try to understand. I'm trying to understand. He studies, he studies it more, and he tries to get him to explain it. He says, no, I have this question. No matter what the guy did, he was able to ask him questions. So you don't get one of the commentaries on one of the pages of the, of one of the books of the Talmud. One of them. You don't understand even that. And you're trying to understand the ways of God, everything? You can't understand. And that's, I think, uh, uh, it's not a cop-out on the question. It's not a cop-out. It's not saying, oh, like, let's leave our intellect, let, let's abandon. No, we're, we're going to delve into it. But it's, it's a general perspective that we really have to absorb because ultimately we're going to be left at some point with – an impasse that we can't get by because the nature of who we are, we're humans, we're fallible, and we're not God, and therefore only really only God knows it. And even the angels who whose their vantage point, their purview is much wider than ours, there's also a point where they got and they could not find the answer. So those are my introductions. And I want to reiterate the question before we try to to try to give an answer, or at least share the perspectives that we find in the writings of our sages. So again, the question of why bad things happen to good people, conversely, why good things happen to bad people, why bad stuff exists. When we ask those questions, we're presupposing three assumptions. A, God has complete, total dominion control over everything. B, God is good, God is just, God is fair, God is benevolent. C, injustice happens. God could have stopped Robert Hill from dying. And he really should have by the definition that we have of God, yet he didn't. That's the context of angels, Moses, Adam's question. So all these three assumptions cannot be true. And I think the way someone reconciles these questions reflects what the relationship with God is. Someone can say, listen, bad things are bad. and They're so bad, there's no way for them to be good, and therefore God's bad. Or, therefore, God is not in control. Both of those are attitudes that are, that contradict our definition of God and our understanding of God's nature or God's treatment of us by more, more precise words. And therefore, what seems to be the general attitude from our sages is that no, everything that happens is good. The question is, what is the nature of that goodness? Is it goodness that we could see, that we could experience, that we could find out? Or is it goodness that's locked out from our purview, but it's good? So 
I want to share some of those uh, options or some of those answers. And this is uh, something we're not going to cover entirely today. We're going to cover it next time as well. So the first option that we see, the first perspective that we see in the Talmud is that when you see something that's bad, you're, you're just your eyes are tricking you. It's really good. God is in control of everything. God is good. Everything you see is good. There's no, there's no conflict. And sometimes the revelation of it being really good can be actually viewable in this world. So, for example, Talmud tells us the book of Brachos, page 54a, a person must bless God when good things happen to them and when bad things happen to them. And the same way that you bless God for good things, you bless God for bad things. Now, the obvious question is, no, you bless God for good things because you're so excited. Bad things, how could you bless God? You're, you're sad, you're miserable, you're depressed, you're pained. Says the Talmud, no, 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 you missed it. It's the same thing. The good, the bad, it's all good. You think it's bad? It's really good. And the Talmud gives a story and a motto and an axiom of Rabbi Akiva regarding this point. And it's interesting that Rabbi Akiva, he appears again and again in this subject. And it's probably not a coincidence. So the Talmud in, in, the Book of Brachos, page 60b. So like the Talmud is the Mishnah, and then it elaborates upon it a few pages later. It quoted a statement in the name of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva used to tell students, a person should accustomize themselves to say, call the Avid Rahmana, Latav Avid. Everything that God does is good. Got to get used to the saying that. And then gives a story. Rabbi Akiva was traveling along the, along the way. And nightfall came and he wanted to find a place to stay. And, and no one wanted to offer him a spot. He had no choice and he had to take a, take his stuff and go to the field and go to sleep in the field. That was his only choice. So what did he say? This is, this too is also good. This is also all, everything got this for the best. In the middle of the night, his situation got worse. He had with him a candle to study Torah with. He had with him a rooster to wake him up in the morning and he had with him a donkey. That was he was his method of transportation. And all those items were destroyed overnight. The wind came, blows out the candle. The uh, different animals come and one animal kills the rooster and one animal kills his donkey. And at each juncture he says, eh, this is also good, this is also good, that's also good. He wakes up in the morning and continues this time on foot. His donkey has been killed. And he sees someone and he finds out that what happened, a marauding band of conquistadors attacked that village that he tried to find lodging in overnight. And they killed or maimed the residents of that town and only a few people got away. And he realized the things that he thought or maybe you would have thought that are bad really are good. And it didn't take him a lifetime to find out he discovered it the next morning. If he was put up in one of those homes, he would have been a victim. If his location in the fields, in the surrounding the city, was revealed either by the candle or by the loud, noisy animals, he would have been a victim. And therefore, the things that he thought the previous day were bad, and he had to say, no, it's really good. I, I don't know why, but it's really good. The next day, he was able to to recognize that really they were good. So I think this is, um, it's an example of, of a greater theme. Rabbi Kiva did not have to wait a whole lifetime. He, it became known that everything God did is, is true. But it's possible, let's say he wouldn't have met that guy who told him about the event that happened the previous night. It's possible he never even knew what dangers he avoided by having those bad things befall him. I think of this as a good example. You know, if you have a small child that's a little bit rumbunctious and the child is chasing after a ball that's running into a street, a prudent, responsible parent tackles the child like a linebacker into the concrete. The child starts crying and the child only arrives at one conclusion. 
my daddy hates me. Who else body slams another one else, another person into the concrete? Daddy hates me. That's the only conclusion the, the child could reach. Of course, as adults, people who have a broader perspective, people have more intellect, we realize that the reason why the parent did that was specifically because they love you, not because they hate you. The child, the smaller intellect, does not understand that. Of course, like we said, the gap between the adult and the child is less than a billion of the gap between us and God. So bad things happen to us. They're really good. We just have no way of realizing that because we're we're small and we're limited and we're fallible and our perspective is very narrow. Maybe we could even suggest Rabbi Kiva was the one who, A, authored the motto called Aved Rahman al-Tavavid. Everything God does is for the best. Maybe the reason why he got to witness it indeed being true was because he was someone that committed himself to that. And therefore, he himself knew it was good because he was someone that always worked on, on recognizing the truth of that, of that perspective. He got a little window into, into, in, into that because he was someone who popularized but also personified this attitude. But I also want to suggest, and maybe another takeaway from this story and from this perspective, and this relates, of course, to the previous discussion that we had over here, it does not say in this aphorism, Robert Hebert did not say everything that happens to someone is good. It doesn't say that. It says everything that God does to someone is ultimately good. This does leave the door open for the possibility, at least, that things that are done by others can be bad. So if God does something, then it's for sure good. If another person does something with their free will, now how their free will can override God is a discussion we talked about in the past. It's a little bit of a, of a complicated problem because God withdraws himself, so to speak, to allow people to behave with free will. And the parameters of how someone's free will can affect a different person is a very complicated discussion that we talked about, we touched upon last time. But just reading the text of the Talmud, it seems that it, like there is an allowance for the concept of people, free will of people doing something to someone which is bad, but not that's not from God. So just another another important perspective to put on put alongside. But I think this is a a um, very powerful idea that we see here, that your perspective of the reality, when you take an account in what happened to you. You're missing variables that you're ignorant to because you have no idea that they exist. And if you were to add the variables, you may have a bigger picture. And if you add enough variables, you'll see why it's really good. God does something bad to you. It's bad, yes, but that's because you don't know the truth. You add more, you discover more of the truth, and eventually you realize how the Almighty was actually protecting you. And I think probably most people have had this experience in their lives. You know, they meet someone. And they're like, this is the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. Or alternatively, this is the school I want to go to. I'm sure of it. This is the job I want to get. I'm sure of it. And it doesn't work out. And sometimes years later, you're like, wow, the Almighty was really protecting me. This would have been a disaster. This would have been a debacle. And I only realize it once I have... More information, more variables have been, have been added. Now I realize that really it was good. At the time, I thought it was terrible. Why did God do this to me? Ultimately, I realized that it was good. But that, I would say, is, is, is an exception. Most of the time, we don't get to witness the fact that it was good. But here, Rabbi Kiva is telling us that it is good. You just don't see it. Sometimes maybe you'll have the privilege of being in on the picture, of being in on it, to know why it was good for you, but most of the times you won't know. Next time, I want to go through some examples of, of this idea from, from the sages. Because there's many times that things happen and there's a deeper storyline and we see how things are good. But this is only the first perspective. There's at least two more perspectives 
of a way to understand why God does things that we initially view as being bad and how we can reconcile that with our definition of God with understanding of how we behave. So we have uh, a few introductions today to this very important and very difficult subject. We have a, a, a perspective that really it's good, you just don't know it, but maybe you'll find out sometime in the future. Next time, next week, we're going to talk about some examples of this in, that in, in history and or uh, in, in scripture. And we're also going to try to understand maybe a few other angles to how to reconcile this. And hopefully we're going to get back to the story of Rabbi Kiva himself and see maybe what he himself would say about the situation. Because Rabbi Kiva himself did opine on this subject. And maybe it's not right for us to talk about someone else's suffering. But we could invoke Rabbi Kiva's teaching himself and maybe use that to relate to his particular story. And maybe even though we can't fully understand it, we'll at least understand his perspective or understand what it is that we don't understand.